All right, welcome back to the Success from the Best podcast. Today we have Ari Malul. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. And uh, Ari Malul began his career in 2002 after meeting Stanley Shuckman through a chance encounter. He puts a strong emphasis on analytics and strategic store planning using mapping and demographic software. Correct me if any of this is wrong. Since then, Ari has gone to, on to work as an agent, associate broker, and in 2012 moved into the role of managing director overseeing the tenant represent, res, representation division of Shuckman Realty. Ari has represented exclusively, exclusively many ten, national tenants in the five boroughs, Westchester, Long Island, and Northern New Jersey. And as of quarter one of 2023, Ari made partner at Shuckman Realty. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right. So when and how did you get into the real estate business? Oh, um, well, technically my father owned a warehouse. He, we had one property and he owned a warehouse in Brooklyn. And I was aware that real estate was a thing, but it was kind of on the periphery. We were always having problems with these tenants. It was in a tough part of Brooklyn on Atlantic Avenue, basically in um, Crown Heights, bed And fast forward, I was offered an opportunity to go down to Georgia to work in the shopping center business with my family who developed shopping centers. <laughs> Uh, graduated college, and unfortunately, that was post 9-11. And right after 9-11, the market really changed. And I was told that there was really no position there for me anymore. And so I came out of college with a fairly useless degree, unfortunately. Which one was that? Uh, major in psych, minor in soch. Okay. Um, and then I had the chance encounter with your grandfather. And about six months after I graduated college, I remember the last name. I remember the card, even though I lost the card. And then I searched online. I came up with the website. I remember, I remember scrolling down because I knew the phone number was going to be at the bottom of that page. And there it was. And that's how it started. Can you walk us through? Because I know it's a fascinating story how you met my grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, I think it was about a year. It was the summer. No, it was the summer before. So I would have been, I think I was a junior. It's like, Junior going into senior year of college. And I dropped off my nephew at LaGuardia Airport. And he was flying to, I think, Texas at the time. And so we had, I'd parked my car at the actual parking garage. And I brought him into the terminal and I kissed him goodbye and I left him. And then I came back to my car and there sitting on the car right next to mine was a really depressing looking cell phone. I mean, my cell phone <laughs> as, as an undergrad with no money looked better than this cell phone. And so I, I looked at the phone as I was kind of getting out of, the, out of the garage and I was fascinated by it because it had no phone numbers inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, this is a person that is in desperate need of this phone because they, they have no phone book, they, have no, they probably have no money. And if I don't return it to them, they're gonna miss work the next day. I concocted this entire story in my wow. mind. And so as I'm driving down the Grand Central Parkway, which I should not have been doing, I was, looking using kind of a, a thumb wheel if i remember correctly and you could you could cycle through the last numbers that were dialed and i dialed the last number that was either incoming or outgoing yeah and uh i spoke to the most wonderful woman her name was lois and my grandmother your grandmother and she was the light and she she said oh this is my husband's phone and he's in uh milwaukee and he'll be back tomorrow and so I gave her my number and then I spoke to one Mr. Stanley Shuckman and uh, it turns out we both grew up in the same neighborhood. Which one was that? Kew Gardens. Oh, okay. So he grew up on 116th Street. I grew up on 118th Street. So wow. we grew up, you know, inches from each other. Different generations. Different generation entirely. Yes. And I was working as a waiter on the Upper West Side at the time and I had my, my Trek bicycle and I biked back from doing the morning shift, doing the doing the brunch shift it would have been like a Saturday or Sunday. And I biked back and I was sweating my face off and I met him at the corner coffee shop and we sat outside and he, he talked about, I remember him talking about the building that we were sitting next to. It was another apartment building. And he started talking about, uh, FAR and 
What's FAR? Floor to area ratio. The okay. ability to build more than what you see in front of you. Mm. Essentially that the building that we were looking at still had this untapped resource tucked inside of it. And that this is not necessarily clear to the naked eye, but once you understand real estate, you understand that this building, you could build more. And I thought that was fascinating. And then I said goodbye and I said thank you. And he drove away in his beautiful Porsche Cayenne, I think at the time. And then I, and I, and I said, okay, this is great. I'm, 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 I'll, maybe I'll be in touch with this guy in the future. But I really didn't think I was going to ever speak to him again. Mm-hmm. But I remembered the last name and that made all the difference because then I was able to look him up even though I'd lost the card. And then, so basically this introduced you to getting into real estate because you probably didn't think about doing real estate before, right? It was 2002. I had a degree in psychology. I had thought about going down to Georgia to do small shop leasing in, um, in grocery anchor shopping centers that my family was developing. And instead, because that opportunity was no longer available, instead I, I called Stanley and I said, you know, can I come in? I don't, I don't know what you do, but I, I'd love to know if it's something that I can participate in. And he said, sure, come in two weeks. And I, and I met up with him and then I sat with him in the conference room and then your father walked in the door and he saw me and he gave me a quizzical smile and the rest is history. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so isn't it crazy how like one action of kindness can get you so far? Cause you didn't have to at all return the phone. You could have left it there. Been like, I didn't see anything and just went on your way, right? Yeah, that's just also not my style. Right. That's but, not my style. But just the point is that, like, it shows how much, you know, the one act of kindness, how far it can take you. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's kindness, mm, but also kind of um, not being apathetic to your surroundings. Right. This is something that I, that I internalized a long time ago, is that if there's a, if there's a problem in the street, there's a story that you learn in psychology. It actually happened coincidentally to have taken place, and this is an extreme example, so, so mm-hmm. pardon me if I'm taking, taking it to 10, but if you take a basic psychology course, there's a very good chance that you learn about Kitty Genovese. And Kitty Genovese was a woman who was, over the course of about an hour or so, uh, attacked and eventually killed. It's a tragic story. But that's not the story. The, story, the, the, the greater story was the fact that I think the number was something like 30 plus or 40 people all witnessed it from their windows. They all saw it happening and nobody did anything, which is fascinating because there's this, um, there is this psychological phenomenon where you think that somebody else is taking care of the thing. You think that you think that somebody else took care of it. You think that the responsibility actually belongs to somebody else. Whereas for me, in that instance and and just how i live my life is if there is a problem uh i'm the guy that 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 i am compelled to say something sometimes to my detriment because you know i'm getting involved in things that i'm not supposed to be getting involved in but that was the same compulsion that went when i saw the the phone all right so uh i want to just take it a little further so um Can you share one success story or memorable or a memorable experience that you had while being in the business that helped shape you today? Oh, wow. Take your time. One success story or multiple one success story that, that shaped me. Um, I'd have to think about that. Uh, you know, um, I'd have to say that we were with, so with your father, and a couple other team members, we were fortunate enough to win the Starbucks account a number of years back. And I think the teamwork involved in winning the Starbucks account was a, a pivot point for me because I watched what happens when you put three really, four, three or four really, really good people together that all have different completely disparate skills, different, different levels uh, across the spectrum of skills. And then that account was critical in, uh, for, for me in understanding the corporate mentality, the level of professionalism that was required and the level of skills that you needed to have. And also the, the, the thinking that get that's involved in corporate real estate and site selection. Um, 
that account as opposed to a single deal, which I, I think you're looking for, but I think that the, this answer is going to give you what you want. That account forced me to start thinking about real estate differently, taking the side of the tenant and being a lot more critical of even the very basic answers that I give when someone asks me a question. I, I had to change my thought process. And, and essentially what it is is it, it, it narrowed down the answering process from kind of this very flowery brokerage language to very specific, very exacting language so that a person could take this information and report back to their superiors. And I think that that was a pivotal account for me. Wow. Okay. Um, so now we're going to jump. Uh, so what motivates you to wake up every day? Cause there are so many people that wake up, they go to work lousy, right? Upset because they don't love what they do. So it's a two part. How do you stay motivated to wake up every day and work your hardest? And also how important is it to do what you love? Oh, wow. Good question. Thanks. Um, so yeah, let's, let's take it in, in that reverse order. Um, first of all, not everybody gets to do what they love. That's just, it's a very unfortunate, um, component of modernity. Um, there's a very small, um, selection of, of occupations that I think are out there. Uh, this is just mid my observation. I, I could be incredibly wrong because there are a number of fields, but what I mean by that is there's a very limited number of fields that I think people can make a good living and also love what they do. And I'm, I'm kind of reverse engineering the fact that I, I consider myself extremely fortunate. Um, I have a lot of friends that are, that are uh, successful and a lot of them are in finance, which seems to be a unique vector to getting what you want financially. But I don't know if any of them love what they do. I may be wrong, but this has been my experience. I think that they go through the motions and they take care of what they need to take care of in order to make the requisite money to survive in New York, because that's exactly what we're talking about, is to be situated in the New York metro area, you need to make a certain amount of money, otherwise you will have a hard time affording anything, especially now with home prices being up, especially now with the interest rates being up, you need to make a staggering amount of money to be even middle class in New York today. Um, I consider myself extremely fortunate because brokerage specifically turns out somehow to to be perfectly aligned with the things that i'm halfway decent at what's that well i started off in food service i think i shared with okay. you moments ago that uh, i was working on the upper east side um just just in in food service doing waiting tables you know waiting tables being a bartender in college for doing corporate events so um high net worth individuals or, or weddings and things like that on the grounds of my old campus. I was fortunate enough to go from server to bartender. So that's, that's interfacing, f front face interfacing with people that were trying to have a good time at these events. Um, but I started off in food services when I was 15. And because of that, you're forced to deal with people on a very different level. People when they're hungry, people when they're expecting certain levels of service, they can act in a very particular way. And it's no different than high net worth individuals or tenants that have requests and needs where they wanna be taken care of on a certain level. And so I've been primed to do that. Um, also, candidly, my father was an immigrant and so his English is not so great. It's not terrible, but it's not perfect. Yeah. He's prone to hyperbole, a lot of exaggeration. And understanding that when people speak, sometimes there is, excuse me, oftentimes there's subtext and you have to understand that subtext. You have to be able to interpret what people are saying and kind of go through this, um, we'll call it marriage counseling, if you will, to bring these two parties together. And I'm, I'm uniquely uh, adept at that. Um, you know, I would, I would, stop the schoolyard beef or the beef with the with the kids in, in the adjacent um uh housing not development but basically we had we had kids on two sides of the fence and there was always a fight that was going to ensue and my job was to stop these fights as the oldest mm -hmm. and i often succeeded in doing so so a lot of what i do is um, mediation making sure that things don't get turned up to 10 
and that everybody stays focused and gets the deal done. Yeah. Uh, what was your first, the first part of this question? I'm so sorry. It was, the um, first part was how do you stay motivated? How do you stay night? motivated? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, there's a degree of stoicism in, in my, in my thought process, which is that good things, there's, there's kind of a truism that I live by all the deals that you work on. If there, if there's, if any deal is easy, it's probably not going to happen. Mm. It, it's just, there's something wrong with it. Too good to be true. Too good to be true. Right. If, if, if you're working on a deal and it's difficult and it's whether that's how long it's taking or the level of, of involvement that you have to be, uh, participating in how, how, um, how complex it is. Um, there's a good chance that it's going to get done because there's all parties are pulling, um, in their own unique directions. The moment there's too much slack, like in a tug of war, if you start feeling that something is loose, that means that someone's given up on the other side and it's probably not going to happen because you need both parties. Mm. So you uh, need that tension. You need that tension ah. constantly. And so I, enjoy tremendously um, dealing with the tension. I'm also fortunate in that I've been able to cultivate and, and, and cull from my book of business the people that I don't want to do business with. So what's left over is 90% of it is the people that I do want to do business with. And I'm very fortunate in that respect. I also have some fantastic junior brokers that I am uh, responsible for their success and helping them cultivate and get better at what they do helping them with their listings, helping them decide what to work on. And I enjoy that tremendously. Um, I consider myself the luckiest person that I know in terms of what I do. Wow. That's amazing. Um, so throughout this whole long 20 years in the company, right? It's, you just passed your 20th year. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm assuming you've had some failures, right? Oh yeah. So, I have a whole box of them. <laughs> so how does, how do you deal with failure and how does it, how does it help you because a lot of people, I think that's what separates, you mm -hmm. tell me if I'm wrong, that's what separates the success from the unsuccessful. It's whether when you're faced with adversity, whether you can grow from it mm -hmm. or if you just quit and you fall down. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people quit. It's a really hard business. It's a really, really hard business. There's two parts to it. Number one is, um, have you signed up for, um, too many financial responsibilities. Did you load up your credit card? Did you buy a nice car more than what you could afford? Mm. Did you buy too big of a house? Um, and is your overhead such that you have this ridiculously unachievable annual obligation, right? Because once you have that looming in the back of your mind, then you have a problem. Because if you, if you were relying on certain money to come in and it doesn't come in, you, you, it gets your head to start spinning. Mm -hmm. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Um, I have always been very cautious about my overhead on a personal level, just because of where I come from. And I, Every time I made a move, which typically means a, a literal move, like from one apartment to another apartment, um, I was very scared because to pick up new expenses, all of a sudden to go from $1,500 a month in rent, split between two guys coming out of college, to $3,500 a rent in rent um, when I moved to my second apartment in Brooklyn and shared that with my now wife. That was a terrifying jump. But I did that knowing that there was also going to be an upside because now all of a sudden I went from being in a sleepy part of Astoria to a very active part of Williamsburg. So there was a strategic move there. Um, and I think a lot of people do that. I think people move to areas where they can be with like-minded people so that they can have uh, future success. In terms of failures, um, I have a box filled with folders of failed deals. You can't even pick up the box. It's so heavy. I'm not even exaggerating. I have very rarely um, dwelled on lost deals. The moment that, it's, that it dies, I, I simply put it to the side. You let it go. If, yes, but if I think that it can be resuscitated, it lives in a slightly different place in my mind and also mm. physically, 
kind of in a zombie area, if you will. But I know when a deal is really dead. When it, and, and it's okay. You, you put it to the side, you try and learn. And what I used to do, I haven't done it as much as I used to write a diagnostic, why it died. And those can be helpful. Sometimes it can also be very painful to, to reflect on it too much. Right. Um, but <clears throat> in this business, and I think most guys can do it. I don't think this is a unique attribute that I have. I think that it's part psychologically, you cannot dwell on a, on a dead deal. You have to keep moving. If Why is you, that? Because if you dwell on it, there's some, there, there is, um, there's no benefit to it. Right. I think people, I think most people realize very quickly in this deal, in, in this business that a, a dead deal, if it's truly dead is only going to hamper them from moving forward. It's like an anchor and it's, it's holding the back. So you, 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 you lick your wounds, you keep moving. And it's a very basic skill that you learn in this business, I believe. So what most people, you think what most people, um, what, what keeps most people back from becoming successful when they're faced with, the, with adversity is the fact that they're not letting go of that failure. Is that I don't know. That's, that's an interesting question. I mean, each deal is going to be so different. So it's hard right. to, it's, uh, and I appreciate your attempt to try and find and tease out of the conversation some sort of maxim, but it's very hard to do so because each deal is so different. Like your father says, it's like, it's like a different child super different you know there's some commonalities right things that you see that are they're similar but they're so different and usually when a deal dies it can also just be from uh just lack of of, of interest you know most of what i do is leasing right um investment sales are, are are things that i do get involved in from from time to time when they when they do show up and i'm able to complete those and i've had success with investment sales but most of what, what we're talking about here on a day to day is me representing a landlord or more likely than not me representing a tenant. Cause that's what I like doing more than anything. I have my landlords that I like dealing with. I'll give them my time. We're always successful. But when there's a failure, it's oftentimes because the tenant just doesn't want to do the deal or the tenant changed their mind. There could be an entire change in, in the corporate strategy that all of a sudden this major corporation, the funding just dried up and they're just not gonna do anything. And there's nothing I can do about that, right? right. That is, that is the, the, the fuel to the fire has been extinguished and they need to pivot and they need to lick their wounds and go and do something completely different and there's nothing I can do. And once I see the distinction between something that I have agency over in its truest sense that I can effectuate change versus something that I cannot, I know when to stop and just let the, the ship sail. All right. Um, what is one thing you wish you knew? What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you first started? Keep a good notebook. What do you mean by that? A literal notebook, a physical notebook. Mm -hmm. When I first started, I was using um, the legal pads. I mean, you, you tear my time, I don't know what that is. It's a long yellow pad. Okay. And you could tear the pages out. You flip it vertically. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. You've, seen, yeah. you've seen all these. The problem with that is, um, and that's also a stylistic thing. Um, anybody that uh, trains with me now uses a notebook. They see how useful keeping a chronological record of your work is with notations so that there is a distinction between uh, that which you have to do and that which you have to remember. Okay. And I won't get too deep into it because it's fairly personal, but you know, we could do this off camera because yeah. this is, this is something that, that I've created that, that is not very hard to create, but it's, it's a very important part of my process, which is distinguishing just what I just said, which is, uh, actionable items versus items that need to be recalled in the future because they're, they're information. Um, I didn't, I didn't know how to do that. It, this took me many years of, of iteration to create. And I, you know, I saw my income double, I think once. Really? Once and you I, think it's because of this? I, not, I don't think I know. Wow. I, I know that the, the system and the notebook and the, even just this little thing right here, just keeping this here, um, it's a game changer. Meaning the business requires you to have great personality, social skills. You don't have to have great personality. Frankly, you could be, you, you can be a little bit lacking in the personality. Depends. You'll have to make it up somewhere else. Right. 
But then you have to have great organizational skills and great follow-up skills and great um, planning skills and then other skills. And you, you know, like your superhero, you know, di different skills in different domains. But, right. but no matter what you do, you still need to have um, your information recorded somewhere because you rely on your information. All right. So you said something about like personality, right? Or make it up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. How important is it if you're that? I mean, I don't know if every person needs this, but to have like charisma. I know so you have it, my dad, my grandfather. How important is it to have charisma when, w whether it's in life or in a deal and a call meeting? I mean, everybody's different, right? right? Everybody's completely different. Charisma is something that I think can be learned. Mm -hmm. I think it's a learned skill based on confidence in what you're saying. Um, in the beginning, it's very hard to be confident in what you're saying if you don't know what you're doing. Right. Um, even though my father, as I said, owned real estate, owned a piece of real estate, didn't, there was no, I didn't have any experience in that domain. So I came into this business pretty dumb, unfortunately. Were you confident as you were dumb? No, I was, I was confident that I needed to be around your father a lot because I knew that he knew all the things that I needed to know, to know and that I needed to spend time near him. Mm -hmm. And so I did that as much as I could. And your grandfather as well. Um, I forgot what the question was. Question was, do you need charisma? Or no, how important you don't. Is it? There, there's a lot of guys in this business that are quite successful with very little charisma, mm -hmm. but are highly intelligent and highly effective. I think charisma is something that just allows you to make a good first impression, but I don't think it's a prerequisite to success in this business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my dad always says that it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. <laughs> so how important is it to network in real estate? Yeah, it's really important. It's really important. I mean, for simple reasons, you know, you want to create as much serendipity in this business as you can. You want to be touching people and you want to be sharing with people what you're working with, uh, sorry, sharing with them what you're working on rather mm -hmm. so that you, you create an opportunity for serendipity for the person to say, oh, I know a guy, right? Because oftentimes it's a problem, whatever it may be. Maybe it's an electrical problem. Maybe it's a, an air conditioning problem. Maybe it's a technical problem. Maybe it's some sort of really complex problem that requires somebody who has tremendous uh, experience in unique financing the things that you didn't even that you didn't know that you that even existed and so if you have people that you trust and you can share deal information with them even if it's a very com uh, confidential deal and you, you talk about it kind of um, with a layer of obscurity so you don't say the names of the tenants or anything like that and you say uh -huh. hey I got this deal that I'm working on and you know people and you share that and they can say hey I can advise you go and talk to that guy but I think it happens on even an even more basic level is by networking you have now a bullpen of people that you can call at least for me on the tenant rep side primarily but also the landlord side so it's, it's both really um that are experts in their field, electricians, architects, engineers, expediters, um, general contractors, lawyers, tax certiaries, uh, brokers that specialize in certain things in other, other markets. You need to have those relationships, which is kind of the flip side of what we're talking about, which is networking, mm -hmm. which is when you call these people, they answer your call. People don't always answer your phone call in this business or in life. And it's becoming more and more prevalent. Why is that? Because it's so easy to hit ignore. Ah, uh, right. And so if you've got the relationship, so it's, it, this is networking that is now expanded because you can network and then the person never takes your call. Mm. Right. That's cool that you, that you met the guy and people will, oh, nice to meet you. This is great. Yeah, let's talk some other time. A lot of that can be just, you know, pleasantries person doesn't want you to think that they're not interested in you. And so I'd say networking is important. Absolutely. But creating uh, a real connection with a person I think is far more important than just the networking, which feels really good. You, you, you're high as a kite after those networking events because you feel like you just created a ton of new connections and that the world is your oyster and you should do this professionally. I should just network. But when the cocktails go away, and everybody's back in their desk 
and they've got their own stuff that they're taking care of. The question is, will they still give you the time of day or should you still be giving them the time of day? And so real, real connections are far more important than, than networking, but networking is still important. All right. So like you're going to ICSC Vegas. Absolutely. All right. So this is my first time. Right. And I Wonderful. got a lot of, I got a lot of work to do. Absolutely. So how do you build, not just cause I'm thinking you just go over to the person, introduce yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Meet them. Now you're familiar with them. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're familiar with you, mm -hmm. but how do you build, like you just said, that actual real connection with them to where they're going to pick up the phone when I call while they're busy? Well, this is a transactional business. This is a transactional world that you live in. Um, this may be a peek deep into my personal psychology, but I believe that people look at other people on a transactional level. I mean like what you have for them that they want. Absolutely. Mm. Whether they want to admit it or not. I mean, even when you have a relationship with somebody, a romantic relationship, there's something that you want out of that. It's not totally altruistic. You want something, they want something. What are you offering? What are they offering? Right? There's some sort of transaction that is happening. Otherwise okay. it wouldn't be a relationship. Otherwise it wouldn't be a relationship. All right. Similarly, when you meet somebody at a show, right? Especially a young person, it's going to be challenging for you to impress upon the person that you have something to offer now, but maybe you have something to offer in the future. That's certainly possible. I take the approach that I know that when I speak to somebody that's young in this business, I assume that they're going to be successful. I assume that I'm going to be seeing them on the battlefield. I assume that they are going to be somebody that I am going to have a relationship in the future and I'm going to need their help. I always make that assumption. And so I've always paid it forward with young men and women. Um, and I've been right 99% of the time that they go on to be rock stars. And so I, by doing that, um, the transaction is I give you my time and in the future, maybe I need a bit of your time, mm. right? It's something as simple as that, right? We can also have a real friendship to, depending on, on whether or not we, we have commonalities, of right. course. And I have people that I do consider my friends in this business. Um, but when you go to these events as a young person, I think you have to lower your expectations, right? The expectation is you're going to meet people. You've got a great name, which is coming from your father, which is coming from his father, right? So that gives you an, o an open door. But now you have to take, you have to stand on your own two feet and you have to offer something. Um, but you're just starting in the business. Right. So what do you offer? How do I have something to offer that a big guy already has? You know what I mean? I'll, I'll tell you the answer. You have to ask, I think it's one very simple question. You have to ask them how they make money. What do they need? Really simple. What do you do, right? How do you make money? What do your transactions look like? And then the person is telling you about them. They're going to say, I, I sell buildings. I sell triple net lease buildings to 1031 exchange buyers. Okay. Or I offer unique financing to people who are trying to buy a property that has some problems, whatever it may be. Or I help retail tenants who need 5,000 square feet in B and C shopping centers and they can only pay 20 bucks a foot. And presumably someone's going to, these people are going to give you a business card, right? And so as you're doing right now, listening to me, paying attention to what I'm saying, you'd be doing the same thing with them. You'd be writing down on the back of the business card as much information as you can, assuming that your pen can actually write on the glossy card. So you want to have a couple of different pens that can okay. penetrate these various plastic and, and, yeah. and paper mediums. And by being interested in the other person's needs, that's how you can start building your business. And people also feel good, not only talking about themselves, but when other people are interested in them, right? Of course, absolutely. So I, I think even like subconsciously, when they see you again, they're just gonna remember that feeling that they felt good talking to you. Sure. And then they'll, you know, 
yeah. one next time I see him, they'll be like, oh, that's him. You know Absolutely. I mean? right. And the quality of the notes that you take vis-a-vis -vis the notebook mm -hmm. or the business card, the business card can then translate notes back to the notebook. The quality of the notes that you take, the quality of the questions that you ask, and also being respectful of the individual's time, reading that person's body language. Are they getting a little jittery? Are they done with the conversation? Do they have somewhere else to be? Right? That's also very important. This is a um, social intelligence, right? Which is very important, knowing when a person's kind of hit a fatigue point. And if you're networking, you're truly networking, like at, at a networking event, that's going to be a big part of it, right? You can say, I, I, I can tell this person only wants to speak for a couple of minutes and then they want to move on because that's what oftentimes what networking can be. Or it could be more meaningful. A person could spend a half an hour with you and be like, hey, I'm going to spend time with you and kind of relive my, my youth by sharing with you what, what, what I know. A lot of people like doing that. A lot of people like to reflect on their own success by speaking to young people. It's kind of this... Um, this interesting phenomenon where, where people feel good about spending time with young people that are earnest, that can maintain eye contact the way that you do, that are taking notes, that are interested in them. Um, I think that asking other people what they need, what they're looking for, what they want out of this room that they're in is an important thing. Because imagine this, somebody tells you, hey, I'm looking for a 1031 exchange property. I'm looking for something for, that's $5 million or whatever it may be. And then you start buzzing around the room and you meet another guy. And he's like, oh, I'm trying to get rid of this property. It's mm. $5 million. You're like, hey, I'm going to put these guys together. That's right? a broker. That's a broker. Wow. That's awesome. All right. I'm hyped now. <laughs> I got I actually got to like prepare a lot for this event, you know, because this is my first and it's a big jump, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, I, my first, my first uh, week in the business was ICSC New York, 2002. Mm. Wow. 2002. And yeah. you went? Of course. I stood wow. behind the, the desk or the podium, whatever it was, and I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but you look good while you're doing what you didn't I, know you were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I, right. All I did, I sat there with a big old smile on my face and I said, who are you? What do you what do? You do? Mm. What, what are you looking for? Everything that I'm describing to you right. now. You know, who do you want to meet at the show? What? what how do you make money? You know, those are good questions to ask. Right. And they can be a little bit disarming because the person's like, oh, someone wants to know about me and, right. and how I'm, yeah, let me tell you. And then you start yeah. writing it all down. And then you keep a catalog of these people because you may need them five years from now, right. 10 years from now. You never know. Wow. Okay. Um, I feel like, I mean, I'm assuming right now, maybe wrong, but I feel like you're the same way. This is how I am. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, okay, I got to get into real estate, right? Like, I have a passion for it. I want to get into it. Mm -hmm. But you kind of want to get to the top from when you start, which is obviously impossible, right? I want to start podcasting. I want to get to the number one, right? But you do need patience, right? You need to work your way up. It's impossible to just get to the top. A lot of people try to do get rich quick schemes, which always fail or they succeed. And then in the long run, they fail, right? So how do you maintain, maybe you don't agree with this, but how do you maintain the patience to getting to the top when you want to just get there right away? Well, I don't know what the top looks like. I don't, I don't know what, what you'd call the top. I don't think there is a top because there's always somebody else that's doing a bigger deal because mm. that's just the nature of time. Time progresses and you can't always have the biggest deal or the largest commission or the best tenant. Things just change over time. So I don't think in terms of top. I think in terms of have I done everything on my checklist today? Have I reached out to all the people that I need to reach out to? Have I spent time with my junior guys to make sure that, that all their needs are met? Have I brainstormed with my team? Have I created uh, goals for the future? Um, th there are a lot, I don't wanna speak too much about kind of the, about society, but I think that, that real estate is a, is a unique counterpoint to other kind of investing and other kinds of, of, of businesses. So I think in particular during the pandemic, people who um, wanted to make money in, in unique ways, if they invested in certain things, they could have doubled, tripled, 10X their money. Collectibles, cards, cars, jewelry, watches, things like that. Um, that's fast money. 
and it sounds awesome. I think it's, uh, it's addictive. It's, you know, it's like when guys go to Vegas and they put money on the blackjack table, whatever it is. I, I don't gamble. So I see that and I see people are thrilled when they win. I see also some pretty sour faces when they lose. Um, I am terrified of losing money. My father lost $32,000, I think it was, during the original dot-com bubble. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of money for us as a family. That was a crushing blow. And that scared the shit out of me. The idea that you can invest in something and it's gone. If you've ever seen that South Park episode. No. Um, real estate... I it is not like that from in in most cases a brokerage at least is not like that it is a long process you start a deal today you will be paid in 18 to 24 months leasing not sales and so you need to build a pipeline and you need to be patient and you cannot have that mentality of quick money because you will be sadly disappointed very quickly so patience is very important in everything, but especially real estate. You come to a very quick realization if you're in retail leasing, even in New York, especially in New York, that there is a cadence to the business. Um, you may be working with a tenant that allows you to collect commissions quicker, but you also need to be working in a way that your commission is almost secondary to the needs of the tenant or the landlord, right? You, you need them to have as much um, space so that the, their deal can can happen without the compression of your commission changing the dynamic of the deal such that the deal doesn't work for either side so your commission including the payout timing of it needs to be flexible got it okay um now if you don't mind going into we spoke about a lot of different things mm -hmm. but more going into the actual real estate mm -hmm. um so what is like the most important thing you focus on when looking for a property the most important thing like I'm saying, because there's a lot of properties out there, right? And there's a lot of a lot of different things that a, that a property can have as a, as an attribute, right? Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the tenant. Let's so let's use tenant representation as as the example okay. because I think that that makes for a more interesting conversation. Tenant representation requires you to first understand the business that the tenant's in, and Stanley Shockman explained that to me very early on in the process, which is to go inside the store. Presumably it's a brick and mortar store, but it could also be medical. So that's a little bit different, but that's, and that's happening more. So we'll put that to the side for a second, but let's use brick and mortar stores for, for mm -hmm. example. What does the tenant sell? What does this business sell? This business then is the tenant signing the lease, presumably. What do they sell? Who do they sell it to? What is an example of a successful version of one of these stores? And can I see it? Which one of these stores of the portfolio is the most successful? Which is the worst? Why? Explain it to me. Why is this one doing better than the next one? Understanding those subtleties, then you can start looking very basically. You don't even need a college education to make these determinations. Why is a store successful? Dense urban area, foot traffic, subway, right? Mm -hmm. Median household income, between 60 and 80,000, something to that effect. Um, they like to be near college students, substitute college students for any race, nationality, ethnicity, different races, nationalities, and ethnicities shop differently. There, there are commonalities, but if, um, if everybody is Israeli, like my father, uh, and they happen to really like buying a particular thing, then you want to know that so that you can help the tenant to find uh, other pockets where this particular nationality exists. And so as you're, before you even begin your scrape for these tenants, you need to understand what makes for a successful version of the store or what makes for a failed store, because that's as important, if not more important. Mm -hmm. And so then you go out into the world and you apply these principles and you look for space. Got it. Okay. Um, where do you think the real estate market is now? Whether, I don't know if New York and the rest of the, the country is different, but where do you think the real estate market is now? And where do you think it's headed? New York is broken up into a lot of different pieces. 
you have so many different markets and they all are so different and there's no there's no way to describe them easily as a whole although i can give you some observations i can say that um the retail vacancy rate within the prime markets that i look in the, the vacancy rates are relatively low but that can also fluctuate it can change very easily market to market um there are parts of manhattan that have been adversely affected from covid that have not bounced back yet and will not bounce back for a very long time and that's very upsetting um it creates a chain reaction within the state coffers the ability to pay for things the ability for the subway system to run correctly to have the right budget the the ability for the state to take care of roads and infrastructure everything is affected by everything else may not be immediately recognizable but on a long enough timeline these things start to metastasize and you can see them as problems and then that affects the market and then that affects the retail and then it affects deals overall i think new york is still quite strong although the demographics are changing everywhere what do you mean by that especially manhattan meaning meaning the people that used to live in manhattan don't live in manhattan anymore i think manhattan's gotten extremely expensive and so um it's less young people mm. more luxury more established families and things like that and i think there was even a study that just came out in the new york times today about that which is very interesting more flight of young people leaving the city going elsewhere got it um and that's going to change if it's enough people but that will change the kind of stores that are going to be looking to open up right mm -hmm. um overall the boroughs that is to say the five boroughs i think are relatively strong if you're in a c part of the market that's a whole different thing that's not even worth talking about but in the reach of the major retail corridors are, are relatively strong we're seeing still very healthy rent numbers that make it very difficult for some tenants who've been maybe waiting on the sideline to penetrate waiting for a discount there really aren't any discounts there was only a discount for a very short period of time during covid and then it ended long island strong westchester strong there are things that are sitting out there that have stayed sitting out there for various reasons either the rent's too high or the parking's not sufficient or the visibility or the access is not good and that real estate's not being rented for one reason or another overall i still think that the metropolitan the new york metro area is still very strong although i do fear that all of the repercussions from covid have not yet been felt um and I'm, i i do have some concerns um but we work very hard to try and fill these vacancies that we see with quality tenants and we've been successful doing that all right that's amazing all right well that's a wrap that's a wrap thank you so much i really enjoyed this conversation i, I enjoyed it as well too. yes okay. yes well, thank you, got, you so much you've got a promising career in podcast thank you well you Thanks. are a very busy man and you gave me about a little less than an hour so thank you so Excellent. much